All right, uh, welcome everybody uh, to Plan Geography 450 at the University of Waterloo in the School of Planning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Marcus Mose. Uh, the regular class is here, and uh, also I'm happy to see a few extra guests we have here today for the presentation by uh, Philip Preville, uh, who is a freelance journalist and a contributing editor at Toronto Life magazine. Um, Philip has a BA from uh, University of Alberta in History and an MA in Media Studies from Concordia University. Um, after his education, he wanted to pursue um, a career in human resource consulting, uh, which uh, I, I then took a bit of a turn and turned into freelance journalism. Uh, so, you know, you can see sometimes you don't end up where you necessarily plan to be as, 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 as students. Um, and, uh, you know, he's written uh, in several uh, national and also more local outlets uh, for the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, for the National Post, En Route, uh, and also El Canada. Um, and uh, he's a former National Magazine Award winner and uh, also a former Canadian Journalism Fellow at the University of Toronto. And of course, here today on our topic of suburbanism, suburbs, and just generally urban change in Canada, uh, we are welcoming here, him here today to tell us a bit more about his writings on um, the new suburbanites, so some, some people that are moving sort of to the far outflung suburbs and what some of the reasons maybe for that, but also some of the people who are, as he's put it, uh, stuck in, in condo land, right? And uh, whether or not, uh, you know, many of us are now suddenly uttering the phrase, you know, screw Jane Jacobs, as he, as he has put it as well, uh, which of course Jane Jacobs is, you know, what the theories and, uh, and ideologies many in the planning profession draw on. So without further ado, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Philip uh, Preville to the, to the class. Thank you, Marcus. Morning, everybody. Um, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I want to just say, for, first of all, that it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I might take my glasses on and off. Hopefully, I won't have to do that. I'm getting accustomed to bifocals. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I'm very happy to, to speak to you about the article uh, uh, that I wrote and uh, other ones since. Uh, and I'm eager to, I'll speak for about 10 or 15 minutes and then I'll take questions and I'm very eager to, 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 to hear what you have to say. Uh, uh, question me, quiz me, challenge me, it's all welcome. Um, uh, I wrote this article uh, four years ago. Um, uh, so it's, it's uh, got a few years behind it now. Um, and uh, uh, a lot has changed uh, in only four years. Um, but a lot of the, in fact, I'd say most of the uh, uh, observations that I made uh, remain pertinent. Uh, and in fact, w one, of the, one of the things that's happened is that I, I made an offhand prediction in the article uh, that has actually come true. Um, I was writing uh, about, early in the article, you may remember I was writing about uh, the way in which sprawl just continues to expand. And uh, I wrote a line uh, something to the effect that uh, uh, the march of sprawl has swallowed Oakville and Port Credit, and it will surely swallow East Willembury too. And this was a way of talking about how formerly quaint small towns turn into subdivisions. And, and uh, literally when I wrote that sentence, uh, I was looking at a map of the GTA, trying to find uh, the name of a far-flung small town that uh, might possibly uh, uh, get turned uh, into subdivisions, you know, 20, 25, maybe 30 years from now. And I found East Willembury on the map, and I thought it had a funny ring to the name. And so literally the line was, it was a gag, right? Sprawl will swallow East Willembury too. But I had some chats with some developers recently, and there are subdivisions going up in East Willembury as we speak. And they don't look like the subdivisions that we've seen previously. Um, there's a lot of semi-detached homes and town homes. Um, uh, the, the backyards tend to be postage stamp sized, uh, so to speak, talking from a satellite map view. But uh, th the fact is that, that the land continues to be developed. And we've even heard uh, recently in the media talk about the green belt uh, and its impact on things. Um, my understanding is that uh, uh, there's lots of developable, developable land within the Greenbelt, but that the pace of approvals 
has slowed, and that's partly because of the Places to Grow Act, and municipalities need to understand exactly what it is they're approving and what kind of density they need to put on the land. Um, but th they're selling th these, these new developments in far outposts uh, are apparently selling the same way downtown condos used to sell 10 years ago, which is that people will line up on the day that they're released and they will buy them off the floor plan. They won't wait for it to be built and walk through it. They'll buy it off the floor plan. So I think this is an amazing thing. This, this, despite everything that we've heard in the last four years about condo development, there's still greenfield development going on and it's still very popular with buyers. So. Um, let, let, let's, let, let's talk about, uh, about the article, The New Suburbanites. Um, uh, I, I got into a lot of trouble for, for using the phrase uh, screw Jane Jacobs. Um, uh, but I was trying to get it at something, uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, the article was really about two things. Um, and the first thing that it was about uh, was the lived lives of people. Uh, people at a particular stage uh, 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 in their life uh, and the, the, the things that they needed to accomplish in their daily, weekly, everyday lives. Um, and it was about the challenges of living in the big city. Uh, it was about the challenges of shared space um, uh, and the negotiation that has to go on when you are sharing spaces with others. Uh, it was about... Um, uh, the challenge of service scarcity, uh, which is something that everybody living uh, in downtown Toronto is very familiar with. And the example that I used quite specifically um, was uh, 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 programs for kids and the way in which uh, the city of Toronto manages registration for programs for kids. Um, and this was actually a, a minor issue uh, uh, in the most recent uh, municipal election campaign. Uh, minor in the sense that none of the candidates addressed it, but there was, were some articles about it. The City of Toronto still does registration for kids' programs um, by, simply by having a registration day. And, and on that day at 7 a.m., you've got to get online and you've got to get on the phone and the line is busy and you call back and you call back and you call back and hopefully you get through and when you get through you have to know the code for the particular program you want to register your child in and hopefully there's still space. Um, and so you've got to have mapped out a plan A and a plan B for your family. You have to have thought through the different uh, uh, commuting options for getting to these things. And uh, and, and there are other examples as well that I could give. You know, I, uh, uh, in the case of my own kids, uh, we wanted them to be enrolled in French immersion, and French immersion was impossible uh, uh, to, to, to enroll for. It was done by lottery, and uh, uh, there were only about two or three spaces available in the lottery at my local school, and of course there were dozens of kids applying. And, and once we moved to Peterborough, of course, uh, 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 the availability of recreation programs for kids, the availability of French immersion spaces at the school board were so much easier. It just took the fight, it took the scramble, it took the competitiveness out of those aspects of your life. And that's a welcome uh, a stress to be freed from. Uh, 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 it, it, it's, it's no fun when you're find yourself competing with your neighbors for spaces for your kids. And obviously, it goes without saying, I think I probably should have mentioned this earlier on, what everybody in my article has in common is that they're all parents. And, and, and parenthood is a great divider um, because lives change radically once you have kids uh, and your daily needs change and your routines change and they become more time pressured and these are some of the things that that, that, that inform people's decisions to move out uh, and, and to move out into the farther reaches of, of, of the region. Um, I talked also a lot about uh, the challenge of mobility and transit uh, and about how the way we normally talk about transit and transportation isn't the way a lot of people live their transportation experience. We talk a lot about, about the availability of transit uh, uh, so that people don't need cars 
and, and these are undeniable virtues. We talk a lot about walkability. That's a virtue as well. And I don't deny those as virtues. Um, the problem comes in when you settle into a, a pattern with a job. And all of the examples I gave are of people who had un unusual, they had unusual commuting patterns. So there was one example of, uh, of a father who uh, uh, found himself uh, doing consulting in uh, presentation styles and public speaking for chief executives, but the majority of his clients weren't in the uh, downtown Toronto core, they were in the other um, uh, uh, major workplace hub in the Toronto area, which is the airport region. Uh, so he found himself commuting uh, uh, from uh, Leslieville uh, across downtown and up into the airport region where there's a, a lot of head offices located there. And, and he found that absolutely exhausting and ex supremely stressful. And, uh, and so he, end and he, end and he ended up moving to Creemore, where his commute ended up being longer. And, uh, but longer in terms of kilometers, but shorter in terms of time and less stressful, uh, and, and that this was a huge welcome change for him. Um, the, the other thing that I mentioned in the article, which I thought, which, which is an interesting thing to, to come back to, you know, I reread the article last night for the first time, and probably for the first time since I spoke at Marcus's class last, that last time, which was a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Simon, the, the, the father that I'm talking about, mentioned that when he does have appointments downtown, he limits them to the hours of between 11 and 3. Um, and what's interesting about that is that I do the same thing now. Uh, I live in Peterborough, but my work is, I, I'm still economically a big a creature of the big city. Uh, I don't work in the local Peterborough economy. I work in the broader metropolitan economy of Toronto. Uh, my work doesn't require me to commute every day. Uh, uh, I usually go into Toronto about once every two weeks. Um, and when I do, I have some of those same rules now. Uh, I didn't when I first moved, um, but I've realized that, that that's what makes the most sense. If I'm going to get out of the city, it's, and it's amazing, the challenge of getting out of the city. I mean, I've realized if I drive downtown, first of all, now I take the GO train a lot, so I, I'm starting to use transit uh, uh, in ways that I hadn't anticipated. But when I do drive downtown, um, the DVP is backed up starting at 2.30 in the afternoon, or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. My, my rule is that I've got to be on the road by 2.30 if I'm going to be home in time for supper. Um, and and, and that's, that's terrible. I know how to do the morning commute. I, I, can, I can sweep in behind rush hour, and I can get into downtown in 90 minutes, but I can't get home that fast. Uh, and, and it's an amazing thing. Uh, and... and and life requires you to develop fairly complicated strategies for coping with that. Um, and the more kids you have, the more walkability becomes a challenge in terms of the variety of things that you need. Uh, and also keeping track of, you know, often you've got two working spouses. Uh, uh, someone, usually when you look at that in a two-income household, someone can walk, someone can take transit, but someone's in a car. Uh, and people change work. Um, uh, on average, I think once every seven years, you'll change your job. Uh, and that's a difficult thing to plan for when you're purchasing a home and deciding where to live and trying to figure out what lifestyle you want. Your, your lifestyle is going to change not just based on whether or not you have kids, but also based on where you're working and what's happening in your career. So all of these things uh, uh, came into play. Um, I also talked about uh, the, the, the challenge of provisioning. Um, and, and this is a, 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 a something, when, when I say provisioning, I mean just provisioning your household. Groceries, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, basic needs, uh, uh, electronics, whatever you, whatever you need in the house. There's a constant flow of goods and services into the, into the home. Uh, and and <clears throat> that's something you need to manage. And one of the challenges of walkability is that you're looking at small stores uh, that, that don't deal in volume, uh, and prices are more expensive. So 
you know, people often talk about that trade-off of, you know, well, I'll live downtown, um, and down, a downtown home or a condo might be more expensive, but I won't need a car. Uh, so I'll save in that regard. But then you've also got to consider the fact that the price of a lot of goods is, is going to be more expensive. And the example that, that I gave uh, the last time I spoke that I think is worth reiterating, uh, again, you know, this is, this is an issue for parents and parenthood. Um, and, and of course, and I had twins, as you read in the article. Um, the prox proximity to deeply discounted diapers is a, is a, is a huge issue for, for, for people. Um, if you buy diapers at Shoppers Drug Mart, you buy them 20 at a time, and they're prohibitively expensive. Um, and Walmart knows this. Uh, big box stores know this. And they know that, that, uh, that, that uh, 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 good prices on diapers will bring people from far away. Um, uh, and it, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's amazing the, the, the way that matters. Um, but it matters in terms of a home's economy and the way you're going to structure your life. I mean, the way I came to, to this realization was, you, you know, it, it, it happened in the moment when I was, you know, I got home from, from Walmart one Saturday afternoon in Toronto. I got in the car and I went out to, to Scarborough and I went to Walmart and I came home and I looked at what I bought and I had three giant boxes of diapers. I had, it wasn't just diapers, there were 200 rolls of toilet paper and there was about 40 kilograms of cat litter. You know, this is, this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a bit of a touchy subject, but this is, this is a big part of your everyday life. And how much money are you going to shell out for these basic bodily functions? Um, people make decisions based on that. Uh, it matters. And it also matters that it's easy to transport these goods um, uh, uh, where you need to get them. And you know, when, you're, when you're buying in volume like that, it's not easy to do it on transit. Um, so, so these were the, 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 the challenges that I tried to lay out in terms of uh, what it's like to live in the big city uh, and the need to make uh, living arrangements that are going to simplify a lot of those challenges. Um, so, so, so that was the first thing that the article was about. The second thing that the article was about um, was about uh, a broader cultural issue uh, the culture class that surrounds the way we talk about the downtown and the suburbs. Um, the, the, the terms urban and suburban um, aren't just markers of a type of housing or a type of neighborhood. They become, uh, in the way we speak about them, markers of identity. Uh, so we attach them to people and they come loaded with assumptions. So that in the same way that you might be white or black or Canadian or Quebecois or Ontarian or American, uh, people talk about other people as being urban or suburban. Um, and this comes loaded with a bunch of assumptions uh, that, 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 that don't advance the conversation very well um, and, and that are, are ultimately, I think, unhelpful. Um, uh, how can I describe it? Um, I guess in Toronto, in the, in the years since I wrote the article, we saw this play out a lot uh, uh, with regards to the mayoralty of Rob Ford. Um, because, of course, Ford's supporters were largely suburban. Uh, his opponents considered themselves urban. I think they were labeled as downtowners. I think they considered themselves urban. But there were labels at attached to being suburban as well. And the whole notion of Ford Nation and who they are. And this is, a, this is an important distinction because Rob Ford, obviously, during his mayoralty, uh, was a controversial man. And there's lots we can say about him. But it's not him I want to talk about. It's not about attitudes towards Rob Ford. It's about attitudes towards Ford Nation, which is really 
uh, uh, a substitute term for suburbanite. Um, and, and what are the attitudes and, and the lifestyles that, that those people have? Uh, they're car drivers. Uh, they are uh, 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 fossil fuel consumers. Uh, uh, they uh, are against transit. They're against walkability. Uh, all of these things have come to be markers of identity when, in fact, these are, these are, these are largely lifestyle choices, I, I would argue. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and I think that, that, that that's a, an important thing. Now, now that, that identity marker is really strong. Um, and we're, we're in a federal election year, so you know, urban issues of transit and housing may very well come up as uh, election issues. And I've got a little anecdote that I want to share um, about a few previous federal elections. Jack Layton, when he became leader of the NDP, I don't know if, how well anybody will remember this, but I don't think it's ancient history. Uh, when Jack Layton became leader of the New Democratic Party in his first federal election campaign, he put forward as part of the NDP's platform an urban agenda for Canadians. And it was about federal money for transit, federal money for housing, and for a number of other urban initiatives. Uh, and he lost badly uh, in that election. Um, and in future campaigns, including the one where he became leader of the opposition uh, and did remarkably well, all of those policies were still present in the platform. But the term urban agenda was erased from the NDP platform. And I asked Olivia Chow why that was, and she said, we realized that this was an issue for a lot of voters. Um, that the term urban, again, is a, is a, is a, is a marker of identity that, that if you don't identify as urban, you took exception to it. Uh, 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 it's hard to talk about transit for people who live uh, in, in smaller towns or even smaller cities. I, we could talk at length about transit in Peterborough um, and the challenges of that. Um, but you, you, the, the NDP seemed to realize that if you were going to talk about transit, you needed to talk about it more broadly in terms of transportation so that in places where transit mattered, you could talk about it in terms of transit. And in places where roads mattered, you could talk about it in terms of roads. Um, this is an interesting, I think this is an interesting phenomenon. And, and uh, I think it will be interesting to see what happens in the upcoming campaign if anyone raises those issues and whether or not they use the term urban uh, to describe that agenda. Um, but the lesson of the NDP seems to suggest that the term is so loaded that it's a political poison. So I don't think this is a very healthy thing. Uh, I think that the identity markers need to be stripped back. I think we need to talk about these things in terms of choices and in terms of choices that have to do with the stage that people are at in their lives. Now, one of the predictions that I made at the very end of the article um, uh, probably hasn't come true, um, although we can't be certain. Uh, I talked about the data which showed that for every person that moved from a suburban municipality into downtown Toronto, three and a half left the downtown for the suburbs. And that was based on the 2006 census. Uh, the 2011 census was unable to replicate and update that data because of the loss of the long form census questionnaire. So we don't know for certainty. We don't have an apples to apples comparison from the most recent census to know if that's still the case. But I wrote the article that you're, I think you're also familiar with about people living in condos and raising kids in condos. Um, and the challenges of that. That seems to be a growing phenomenon, um, but it's a challenging one. Uh, uh, and and it's, one who's, it's one that's ongoing, and it's one whose outcome is uncertain. Um, uh, whether or not, uh, I, I think that it's driven partly by values in terms of people wanting walkability and proximity. I think it's also driven by scarcity. Uh, 
You know, and, and economic scarcity is a, is a big, big factor in people's lives. Uh, you know, I was, I, was a, I was a late bloomer in terms of having kids. I had my kids only when I was in my late 30s. And that was a product of scarcity as well. I, you know, I, I, I went through the recession of the early 90s. The notion of, of having kids in my 20s, it just wasn't feasible. Um, in the same way, today, for young parents uh, with new kids or planning a family, you, you've got to go out to East Willembury to get yourself a, 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 a house at grade level. Um, so you've got the option of your condo and of remaining downtown. Um, it's, 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 as I say, it's partly values, but it's partly a matter of, of housing scarcity and of figuring out the best way to live. And, and I think it's worth underlining just what a big social transition that is that's happening in downtown Toronto. Um, and I don't know what it's, what it's like here in Waterloo, but I mean, this is, this is a big change. We're changing the way that people have lived, the way that people have raised children, uh, uh, the way they go about their lives. And it's not a change that comes easily. Um, and I know that when the article was published, there, there was a lot of, of people who were angry about the article for what it had to say uh, because they felt that it didn't speak adequately to the virtues of walkability and proximity. But my perspective was that those things are changing and those things are becoming values, but they chafe against the values that we had before and they don't always take. Uh, and, and that those conflicts of a changing society were what we're worth, ex were what we're worth exploring. So anyway, so I, I think that's everything that I wanted to say. That's kind of a rundown of the article. Um, I, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, and as I say, I'm, I'm eager to hear from you and, and to know uh, uh, what, what you thought of the article. I'm, I'm wondering if any of you thought it was heretical when you read it. Um, and if you did, don't hesitate to speak up. You, you, you won't surprise me. No. Oh. Well, thank you very much. Uh, certainly, uh, very interesting issues raised that also resonate, I think, a lot with um, you know the, the the topics we've touched upon in in this class. Uh, a phrase I started using in in this course is we we can't just plan for croissants, right? And sort of arguing that there are underlying values that a lot of planners take with them, and then not to suggest there's anything wrong with those values, but to sort of be reflective that maybe not everybody shares those values. And I think some of your writing really gets at the core of that. And I think sometimes that's a very difficult thing to to confront. I think. As, as professionals, what are actually the values we bring to the table? Um, in any case, so um, you know, this is one of the reasons I've always been very intrigued by your writing because it kind of challenges people on their on their norms. I think um, questions, uh, critiques, yeah. So the question was that, why did you start uh, beginning uh, to write about this, this topic? Yes. Um, uh, the, the honest answer is that, uh, in some measure, I fell into it. Um, uh, uh, I had been working at a sister publication of Toronto Life called Saturday Night for a number of years. And uh, uh, Saturday Night folded. and. Uh, uh, Toronto Life approached me and asked me if I wanted to try writing about urban issues, uh, specifically about uh, uh, city politics and city hall. And so that's how it started. But it grew from there. Uh, and it grew uh, uh, quite organically. I mean, I was fascinated. I quickly became fascinated with, as I immersed myself in Toronto's civic discussion. Toronto has, a, I, I think, you know, you're all planning students and geography students. You've all got a very elevated uh, a basic conversation about these issues. I find Toronto civic culture actually also has a very advanced civic conversation about these issues. People understand a lot of these issues quite well. But Toronto was also in the midst of a, you know, it, it, when I started writing about these, are, these issues, Toronto was in the midst of a, the beginnings of what's become a major, major transformation. The condos were just starting to go up when I wrote about this. Uh, and there was a move to 
uh, densify uh, 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 unused spaces or underused spaces uh, in, in key parts of, of the city. And there was a lot of resistance. And I recognized at the start, uh, I remember my, in the very first column I wrote that Toronto was in the midst of becoming something it wasn't. That the city of neighborhoods was, was, was going to look something. The city of neighborhoods to me is code for a city of small towns. Right? A city of neighborhoods. You can go to any neighborhood and it's kind of like a small town. Uh, and it, and it's, it's very funny. You know, the drive from Peterborough to here, you know, every town has a street called Brock Street. There's like a million Brock Street exits. And they all look the same. They, all look, they, they were all built about 150 years ago. They're beautiful. They're beautiful and they're quaint and they've got some pubs and some shops. And none of them are quite as vibrant as Toronto's neighborhoods. But you look at those small towns, if you've been to Uxbridge, if you've been to Peterborough, and then you go into a neighborhood like uh, Roncesvalles or Parkdale or Riverdale, and you realize, you know, like my life in Riverdale on the Danforth, it, it looks like that. It looks like Peterborough on George Street. You know, and, and that's what the city of neighborhoods, when people take pride in a city of neighborhoods, that's what they're taking pride in. And that was changing, and it was changing, it was going to change radically, and I think it has changed radically. Um, and, and, and that's where I took a keen interest in this. And then this particular article grew out of my own move, obviously, um, uh, which was a fascinating uh, process in and of itself because I was already, the twins were born, my wife was going back to work, uh, I was still at work, we were chafing against the city uh, in ways that I described you know, I used to take my one son down to Young Dundas Square, but now I've got three kids and the double stroller doesn't fit on the streetcar. It's interesting to note, Toronto's trying to cope with all of this, um, but it's going to take decades. You know, the new streetcars have wide doors and there's no steps to get up. They're low-flow streetcars. The double stroller will fit in the new streetcar, um, but it didn't at the time and it was part of the challenge. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and of course, it was my wife's work that caused us to move. And one of the criticisms that I received when I wrote the articles, well, well you know, you didn't really, you know, you're moving for work. Um, but as I said, in a two-income household, this is, often, this is often the case. And this is often how people come to confront their relationship to the city. My wife had a, had a, had a, a job offer outside the city. Now you've got to confront your relationship with the city. Is it working? Is it not working? What are the challenges? What does a different community offer? Um, and so that's how it, that's how it, it, it grew out of that. Um, and and I, I, I love writing about it. I, I'm, I, I've got lots of ideas. I'm not done. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was just curious uh, why you wrote the articles about families with young children and maybe not profiled families with uh, older children, either like preteens or teenagers. Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, the, the magazine was keenly interested in, in families with young kids. Um, but I think, I, first of all, uh, and that's, you know, that's partly because that was part of uh, the growing demographic at the time, right? I mean, that, young kids are uh, a phenomenon right now. Um, and you're seeing it all over the city, you're seeing, seeing it all over uh, the region. Um, so that was a big reason why. Um, if you looked at families with teenagers, you know, the decision-making process that I'm describing amongst all of these families, uh, people with teenagers today right, would, would have made that decision 10 years previously. And 10 years previously, where would they have been able to live? Uh, they would have been able to live probably still on a transit line. They might have been able to, to, to go up Young Street, uh, you know, maybe the Young and Lawrence area up in and around Sunnybrook Hospital where they can still get uh, good transit access. They might move to North York uh, where again they've got transit access. So the challenge for them in terms of keeping their life organized isn't the same. The people I'm talking about when they come to confront that decision, there's really nothing available in their price range in North York or, uh, or uh, in Lawrence Park. 
um, or even in, in, in some, of the, some of the nicer areas of Etobicoke. The places that you would go where you could say, okay, I can make a, a trade-off and I can uh, take transit to work or I can still drive to work if I need to. Um, you know, now pe you know, the people I profiled, they don't have that option. They've got to consider, can I ride via rail into work? And if I do that, do I have to commute every day because it's exorbitantly expensive? So it was a different set of of constraints and a different set of questions that people were asking, or maybe not, maybe not different questions, but the answers that they were coming up with were different than what we'd seen in the past. So I found it interesting how you were mentioning um, people are changing jobs on average every seven years, and there's two income households and everything. So I was wondering, do you see a disconnect between kind of what planners advocate uh, advocate for? working, uh, living where you work versus the realities of people changing jobs so much in today's world? That's an interesting one. Um, in the course of my reflections and preparation for the course, I was thinking about w one of the great benefits of living downtown that we don't talk about uh, uh, is its commuter access to anywhere. Um, because of the GO train line. You know, if, if I am working downtown and I choose to live downtown and then seven years later I switch jobs and I'm suddenly working in Whitby, I can go to Union Station, I can get on the GO train and I can be in Whitby uh, in an hour uh, in a hassle-free, uh, enjoyable commute where I can get work done or I can read, I can relax. Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, an interesting phenomenon that we haven't yet heard that much about, but that I think people are going to start to talk about. It's a, it's a it, living downtown. We always talk about it in terms of living close to where you work, um, but living downtown also has the advantage of uh, uh, being in the best possible place if you're not going to live close to where you work. Um, but, but by and large, I, I do think that that. Uh, that there is a there is a disconnect, um, but I mean, how how can we? I'm trying I'm trying I'm, I'm trying to work it through here right as I stand at the podium. Um, you also can't plan to move your house uh, every seven years, um, so. I, I, I think I think it's a challenge. I'm not sure what the answer to that to that conundrum is. Um, uh, 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 transit access is obviously going to play an important role in that, but I, 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 I think that's something that uh, is hard to plan for. You don't know where your next job is going to be. Um, and so that, that becomes a challenge. Uh, um, and and I, I, I'm, I'm not sure where, where, where the solution lies to that. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, if you want to ask a follow-up question, uh, Back in the day, there, it might have been more stable that you can think, oh, I'm going to work at this manufacturing plant and that's going to be my life. I didn't know if planners were still kind of thinking, they weren't uh, aware of the realities that everybody moves around today. So are, are we still kind of uh, advocating the same stuff, but it doesn't even apply anymore? Well, that's a good, now that, now that's a good question. I don't know the answer to, but, but do planners still work from the assumption that, that people will have 30-year careers, Marcus, at the same manufacturing plant or financial services center? I think in, in general, I would argue that they don't assume that, that there, there is a realization that, you know, people switch jobs frequently. And I think in, in sort of the, at least in the theory, the attempt is, is if you cluster as many jobs as possible in and around transit accessible locations, and you cluster people living around transit as well, even if those two places aren't exactly in the same spot, right? The notion that you to kind of work where you live, that's likely only gonna apply to sort of a limited number of, of people in the long run. But certainly that if you provide the transit accessibility that people could, uh, like you're describing, right? If you live downtown, you have that transit flexibility, if I'm gonna call it that. So I think planners are thinking about it, but I think also that um, planners are, 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 are probably uh, constrained a bit by their sphere of influence because some of these questions really relate to sort of macroeconomic changes around, you know, how uh, temporary some of our jobs have become. So that's a really a, a challenge. And I, I find that some of these questions, you know, are really 
uh, questions that we might have to ask ourselves sort of at the macroeconomic level. Do we want an economy where people switch jobs every two, three, seven years, right? And those are sort of diff more difficult questions to confront just within the urban realm. But uh, I'll, okay, I'll have more to say, but I, I'll keep it at that. Well, and, and I'll just add a couple, because now, 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 now that you've put it that way, there's a couple of, of observations that we can make. The first is that I mentioned earlier that the, the, the second largest employment hub outside of downtown Toronto is the airport district, has terrible transit access. Um, the Union Pearson Express will hopefully change it. There's a lot of high hopes for that and a lot of concern about the price of it because uh, the expectation is that, it, that the Union Pearson Express isn't just for uh, people traveling to the airport to catch a flight, but for people who work in that district. Um, uh, and so that's an issue that, that I think the region's trying to resolve. Uh, I think another example uh, uh, closer to where I live um, is, you know, when I look at, at uh, the GO train stations along the East Lakeshore line, uh, Oshawa, Whitby, Ajax, they have, Whitby and Oshawa doesn't, but Whitby and Ajax and Pickering have giant parking garages, which I use, but they're really just surrounded by parking. Um, and it seems to me that, that you, you know, a, a GO train station like Ajax or Whitby, you know, has really easy transit access to this fantastic young demographic of educated, creative class worker that, you know, employers are locating downtown to be closer to those people. But, you know, and, 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 and the challenge for, you know, Durham region is to try and keep people locating where they are, right? And keep people settling there. But maybe, maybe that's the wrong issue. Maybe what you need to be doing is locating employment close to, to, these, to these transit hubs, right? They don't need to be commuter hubs where people just drive to them and then get on the train and go downtown. People could drive to them or people could take the train to them and they could work there. Um, uh, it, 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 it's a possibility that I'm not sure planners have a adequately considered. And I think it might be uh, 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 something to consider in the future. Yeah, and I think, you know, in terms of, of the, the, the theory and uh, the, the, in, in the planning realm, people are talking about exactly what you're describing as transit-oriented development, right? And so I think we haven't seen that materialize in, in practice the, the way that some planners wish maybe it would have. So, you know, what you're describing is really the issue that we actually have some outerlying suburbs that would have great transit access into the downtown, but what that place doesn't provide is the sort of living, uh, an urban amenity that maybe some of those younger people seek, right? So if you get off the train there, the only option you, only in quotes, but in a sort of realistic option, is to get into your car to go somewhere else. If you get off the train there and you want to walk somewhere, it's not going to be a very appealing, um, uh, um, you know, option. So if you suddenly had, even if you had, uh, you know, um, a higher density environment, maybe with a public square, right, and some cafes um, and shopping, you could not only, let's say, get off the train and maybe do your grocery shopping on the way home, but uh, you'd also maybe, maybe entice some people to live there in a denser setting um, than we are doing now if we just have... Um, you know, parking around these stations. I mean, there's the other objective from a transportation side is to say, well, a lot of these people are commuting currently into the inner city. So then, you know, we, we can't stop them from bringing the car at least to the edges of the GTA. So at least let's get them in transit as they arrive. So that's sort of another competing uh, objective there. I think that's, you know, is another. No, and, 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 I, and I think what I, what, what I, what the other thing that I'm suggesting as an additional uh, uh, a dimension to that is that you can locate jobs at those, at those GO train stations, right? Um, you know, uh, 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 every municipality is in the business of, of trying to you know, create employment and, and put employment in various places. Um, and to the extent that there might be white collar work uh, that, that could be located in those places, um, proximity to the transit station uh, opens up those businesses to a whole uh, a, a vastly larger uh, and more educated workforce. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, this is more of an opinion. Um, I think that um, if you made a comparison with a smaller scale city, maybe a lot of the challenges that were brought up won't be like as many. 
like let's say because Toronto is such a big city obviously it's really hard to manage all these problems like services but I think if you compared it to a city like Portland Oregon um, a lot of the challenges would be uh, not as prevalent like for example you compare it commuting um, from like one side of the city to another or like just traveling through Toronto but maybe if you com look at um, people who work in Portland and live in Portland like they have a lot more time and then that that helps with their lifestyle and then all the challenges like the services lack of services probably Portland has a lot of sufficient services and so do you think that would have changed if you compared it to like a smaller scale city because Toronto is such a massive like it's yeah. Toronto is Toronto and this is a Toronto story. No, I don't disagree with you for a minute. Although I don't know uh, where Portland stands in terms of availability of services. Um, you know, I, I visited Portland once before it became Portland. Um, uh, it was a lovely place and they were just, I, I, I visited, uh, you know, the warehouse district that had just recently been uh, renovated and, you know, and the city has become a phenomenon. Um, uh, it, Toronto is Toronto. Tr Toronto has uh, density challenges uh, that are hard to uh, uh, hard. Y y they're unique, right? Uh, you've got condo towers going up and people moving into them, and that's putting pressure on things like existing transit services. Let, al let alone the transit expansion that's required. Just the existing transit services downtown are under intense pressure. Um, and it's a challenge for the city to deal with. Um, certainly, you know, it's, I'm living in Peterborough, which, you know, I mean, now that's a smaller city than the one you're considering. Let's think about this. Um, anybody from Ottawa? Yeah? Ottawa had these kinds of challenges? Probably not to the same scale, but... Right. You know, so, so, so you do see it there. I know in Edmonton, where I lived for my teenage years, which is a city of under a million, right? Actually, 650, 750, I've grown a lot since I was there. Um, uh, they, they've vastly expanded the rail transit network. Um, uh, but congestion is an issue in, in Edmonton in a way that it hasn't been. All of these things are relative, too. You know, I mean, in Peterborough, people complain about congestion. Uh, uh, you, ha you, you, you can you, only if you lived in Peterborough all your life would you complain about congestion in Peterborough. Uh, uh, you know, um, and and even in Peterborough, by the way, the the downtown versus suburban identity divide that I talked about is alive and well. Uh, uh, by Peterborough standards, I'm a downtowner. I live close to the city center. Uh, I walk when I can. I take my bike to work in the summer. Um, and, uh, and th there's, you meet people who have an intense dislike of downtown uh, for, for, the, for, 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 for what seemed to me to be the flimsiest of reasons. You know, they couldn't find parking or they needed to go to the bathroom. And, you know, the mall has a bathroom, but downtown there's no bathroom. And they walked into a restaurant and the guy wasn't friendly. And he's like, that happened 10 years ago and he's still mad at that. He still won't, refuses to go downtown. You know, pe people, attach themselves to these things and for the, for the strangest reasons and, and, and don't let go. It, it becomes part of who they see, who they believe themselves to be. Anyway, um, but to, to get back to the question, it, Toronto, Toronto's, Toronto's problems and issues are unique. Uh, Vancouver's, I think, going through something similar. Um, but uh, but it, it's, it's hard to compare to, to other cities, for sure. So we have time for one quick question. So we have a couple minutes. Yeah, let me come over here so pick up the sound. You speak of the condo kid. Do you see a growing um, division between people living in the suburbs and people growing up in downtowns like in 10, 15 years? Like, do you see trends? That's a good question. Um, my sense of things, uh, uh, on that front, first of all, I think there's a, there, there's a lot of urgency to the issue of raising kids in condos downtown. And if you read that article, I talked about some of them. I talked about 
it, it, the, 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 the issue with the availability of parks and safe public spaces in proximity where, 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 where kids can go uh, and be safe, uh, those things still aren't there to the extent they need to be. Um, you know, there are, there are some, some, some wonderful parks uh, right in the heart of downtown Toronto, but they're destinations. You need a place that's on your block. Uh, when you've got toddlers, you need a, a place where you don't have to cross a major artery to get to it. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think the, the city planning department is seized of that challenge, right? Of the, of the need to create family-friendly spaces and amenities downtown. And, and that's going to be a challenge because it's going it's to require not just parks, but as kids grow older, it's going to require rinks and fields and, and schools. Uh, and schools are a challenge, and, and the issue of building new schools with the Toronto District School Board is a thorny one uh, because they've got too many schools as it stands, uh, and they need to shutter some, which they're reluctant to do, but they also need to be building new ones um, uh, in places where families are locating. Um, in, in some ways, though, that, 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 uh, that divide you're talking about you know, is, is, it's, it's kind of, it, it, it's an eternal one. And I think what we're going to see is a reversal of it. You know, they're, they're, uh, you know, I, as, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to pinpoint the time, the time frame. But I would say, you know, that, that you saw movies in the 80s uh, uh, about, a culture divide amongst teenagers. There were the, the kids who were raised in suburban bungalows, and then there were the hard scrabble kids from the downtown. And I actually think that goes back beyond the 80s. Um, but you know, th that, that hard, hard scrabble life lived on busy downtown streets uh, and learning to get by um, uh, 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 using your wits uh, versus the kids who were coddled in the suburbs. I think that's. Reversing. Um, certainly, Toronto's inner suburbs are in a state right now. They're pretty hard scrabble neighborhoods. Uh, and, and what you've got downtown is massive gentrification. Um, I don't know that uh, the kids who live uh, downtown uh, uh, are going to see themselves as hard scrabble. Um, I don't know that we'll talk about them as hard scrabble. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to navigate a dense urban environment. Uh, uh, in a way that is healthy uh, and clever and smart, um, but I, I don't know that it will come with the same, uh, the, the usual uh, uh, associations with economic class that they used to. So I think that'll be possibly, there, there, there's a prediction for you that I'm not going to stick around to find out if it comes true or not. <laughs> Well, I think that's an, an excellent uh, uh, note to, to, to leave it on and for us to, you know, ponder further about, uh, you know, what the future will hold for, for the Canadian and, and North American city and suburb and uh, how these uh, trends evolve and will continue to shape us into the future. So join me once again in, in thanking uh, Philip Preville for making that. Uh, the trip down here all the way from Peterborough and uh, for those of you who'd like um, uh, we are going to go have uh, uh, some coffee and, and maybe even a croissant who knows um, uh, and so feel free to, to join us uh, so just stick around if, if you'd like to do that uh, and uh, thank you again for your attentiveness and uh, we'll see you next Thursday thank you